An NBA veteran whose story began as a refugee. Originally from South Sudan. I left South Sudan when I was five years old uh, because of uh, the civil war there. He found comfort in one sport. Growing up, everything was uh, saga to me. Till today, I still love it. But thanks to a fellow Sudanese and former Heat center, another prevailed. For me, basketball really started because of Manu. Look at that. He created his signature style in the Windy City. What really allowed me to play was my defense. Remarkable defensive play by Dang. And now he brings it to his new home. Dang with a gorgeous block. His drive goes beyond any place he lives or sport he plays. I really just want to give kids a better chance. Believe me, I want to help everyone here. I always felt like helping people is my purpose. Inside the Heat, Luel Dang. Welcome to Inside the Heat. I am Jason Jackson. We're on location at Soccer Rooftop in Miami's Brickell area, just south of American Airlines Arena. And it's the perfect backdrop to tell the story of Lou Day. You see, soccer is called the world's game. And his NBA journey has taken him literally halfway around the world, three continents in all. So, Lou, first of all, for the fans that don't know your entire story, take us back to where you're from and then tell the story how you got to the United States. Originally from South Sudan. Um, I left South Sudan when I was five years old uh, because of uh, the civil war there. My family moved to Egypt, Alexandria. We were refugees uh, in Egypt for four years. Then we moved to uh, England, where we were also refugees. My family still lives there. Uh, but when I was 14, I came over for high school. In, uh, in New Jersey. Before we figure out how basketball weaves into your story, it is uh, no secret uh, due to your attire, due to our location, uh, that soccer is a passion. Uh, so walk us through how soccer changed for you and basketball became the primary focus. Growing up, everything was uh, soccer to me. We made the soccer ball out of socks. Uh, we made it out of balloons. We made it, uh, you know, we played with tennis ball. We couldn't really afford a real soccer ball. Just loving the uh, game, though, right? Yeah, but it really, you just played. And then when we moved to England, uh, it was my first time really playing with a soccer ball and playing in the real grass. And I fell in love with the game. And, you know, till today, I still love it. But what happened was I wouldn't stop growing. I was bigger than everybody else. And basketball was always there because my brothers played basketball also. Um, so I, I played with my brothers and then eventually I started playing basketball. You are the second Sudanese player to play for the Miami Heat, as you probably know by now. Manu Ball uh, played in the mid-90s for the organization. What type of influence did he have? For me, really basketball really going down the line, it really started because of Manu. Manu took a vacation to Egypt and he went and he saw a bunch of kids uh, at a church. There's a church that we go to every Sunday. And that's the only basketball court in the whole city. And he saw a bunch of kids playing basketball. And he actually extended his vacation to a month uh, teaching you know, these kids how to play. And two of those kids were my brothers. And they then taught me the game with the rules that they learned from Manute. And that's how it started for me. When did you know that you had an affinity for the game that was beyond just learning from your brothers? Well, when I came over, uh, when I was 14, um, I came over really because my dad wanted me to look after my sister. She's the one who had the scholarship uh, to go to high school to play basketball. Okay. And, um, you know, my high school coach, I was coach in college, and right away after a month, he was telling me how good I could be, and I uh, started to be more serious about basketball. You were killing it at Blair, so much so. Uh, in 2003, you were regarded uh, the second best player in the nation. So having that particular distinction, that ranking, did you know at that point, you know what, there, there's a career possibly waiting for me. You know, I never, I never knew how it worked. I just played. By my junior year, Duke started to be very seriously recruiting me. And uh, that's when I really knew that I really have a chance to play in the NBA. You know, growing up as a kid, I always thought I was going to be a soccer player. I had to kind of make that switch uh, and believe that, you know, NBA was it for me. And uh, once I did that, I never really thought twice about anything else. 
Well, Coach K and his recruiting machine was good enough. They got you. You came to Duke. You were the best freshman on the planet. Look at Dang. Dang with a three. Got it. What did you take from your experience? Not a lot of people get the chance to be coached by Coach K. And um, one thing that really stood out for me, going from high school, I just played. I didn't know how much it took, you know, preparing for the game. And once I went to Duke, I learned a lot in terms of what it takes to, to be great, the focus level, the preparation level. And that's something that I took with me to the league. He's got Duhon, the trailer, ding, and goodbye. And you did it immediately. You were one of the rare uh, one and dones at that time. As you were approaching the draft, what was going through your mind? It was tough making the decision whether to stay or leave. A lot of people don't really understand that. It, even though you're about to start your, you know, your career, you still have ties. You still have relationships that are really hard to let go. And at Duke, I, I really felt that you know it was a family atmosphere. It was just a tough decision. Welcome back to Inside the Heat. After being one of the nation's greatest high school players, one season at Duke was sufficient to settle the issue for Luol Deng. He was headed to the NBA. His draft night, though, was going to be special. He was headed to the lottery. With the seventh pick in the 2004 NBA draft, the Phoenix Suns select Luol Deng from Duke University. Those first, you know, six pick before me, it was nerve wracking because you just thought, what if that team doesn't take you? Uh, how far are you going to fall? And whether you made the right decision or not. Once I really heard my name, I was just glad my mom and, and dad were there with me. And my brothers loved the game of basketball. So to see me being drafted or being in the NBA uh, was something special. I was happy for my family more than myself. Originally drafted by the Suns and then subsequently traded to the Bulls, Deng recounts how he found out. When I was drafted, at first I thought I was going to Phoenix right. until after I did my interviews. So I sat there and I was talking about how great it is to play with <laughs> Steve Nash. All the great things uh, about the great city of Phoenix. Phoenix right? is a great city, the weather, I can't wait. And then yeah. you get the hat and you're like, right, right. you know, you're going to Chicago. So then I was like, yeah, I can't wait to go to Chicago. It's a great city. It's, what I, it's where I wanted to go. Tell me about your first year. Yeah, you really hit the ground running. And uh, a lot of rookies have a tough time transitioning. What really surprised me was the freedom that you have. And I think you really have to be mature and have a lot of discipline. Or you got to be extremely, extremely talented where it comes easy. If you're really trying to show up and play, it's, it's not going to get it done. Not only are you trying to score against the best athletes. Dang with a rebound. Powered in. That's what I'm talking about, sweet Lou. Dang, shot clock down to three. Dang off balance, knocks it down. But you also have to play the best defense you could play or someone's going to embarrass you. For me, what really allowed me to play was my defense from the get-go. Shot rejected by Lowell. Remarkable defensive play by Dang. I just felt like whoever I'm guarding, I had to play as hard as I can. My mindset was always, I got to play defense to stay on the floor. Lieutenant Dang. Nine and a half seasons there, what did it feel like being a part of such a decorated franchise? I never thought I was going to play in one team for that long uh, to begin with. When I was drafted, I just wanted to play, do the best I could do. And, you know, every day I just thought of how can I get better? And before you realize it, it was nine years into it. You know, you can't do anything forever. And so I'm really grateful for those years that I've had there. Bang down the lane. Oh, oh he can I get some hands. butter with that roll? Lou all day. Coach Thibodeau was your last coach in your Bulls time. He called you the glue. What did that mean to you? to be responsible. Uh, you know, I think, I don't know if that was the first time that word was used, but it's used in every team now. I did everything that I could to be the best I could be in terms of I showed up early, I shot early. When I see the locker room going south, I kind of try to get everyone uh, focused on what we got to do. You know, I just became a leader in terms of being ready for the game or, you know, getting your mindset right. And I knew a lot of people always watch what I was doing and I try to do the right thing. Dang's all-around skills were rewarded as he was selected to the All-Star team two years in a row in 2012 and 2013. Also in 2012, he became an Olympian and he decided to play for Great Britain 
with the games being held in London. To me, it's one of my highlights in my career just because being a refugee, the way it works is so when you're a refugee, you pretty much put in your name to the every government, different countries, and they select families. So it's pure luck. And my family was selected by the British government, so they gave my family a chance. So one thing that I could do was really play for the country that gave me a chance. And um, playing there, growing up there, seeing all everybody show up at the game and the Olympics being in your backyard was really just an amazing experience. So after all that time with the Bulls, you said you didn't know and think that you're going to play for the same team forever. It didn't happen. You're traded to Cleveland. Walk us through that transition. It was tough. I mean, the middle of the season. I think it's different when you're traded in the summer. Uh, you come in, you get used to the guys. You go to bed one night uh, thinking about what I got to do to make the team better, the guys you're battling with, and you get the phone call and you're no longer part of that. Going to Cleveland was different. I had a different role. I found myself as one of the oldest guys in the locker room. I had to be uh, more of a voice more than anything. I'm not really the type of guy that's always talking in the locker room. This was just a young group that's still learning a lot. As you got to the summer, it's free agent time, and you have a choice. What were you initially looking for in your next team? What I really wanted was a team that knows how to win, a team that I could go to and, and make it a better team. And to be honest, I wasn't sure about Miami. Uh, I really wasn't until I sat down with Pat Riley and uh, Coach Bo. And I'm just glad that I ended up here. Welcome back to Inside the Heat. During the free agent period in the summer of 2014, Heat President Pat Riley and head coach Eric Spolster were traveling the nation trying to find players to fill out the Heat roster. They didn't think they could get Luau Deng, but they decided to stop and have a discussion anyway. It was critical. How has it been transitioning to uh, paradise after all your fine winters in Chicago and Cleveland? No, I mean, I love it. You know, just even doing this interview right now in the winter outside, uh, you know, it's something that I've never done before. So it's so much you could do. Even when my family came over, they loved it and how much they enjoyed the weather. You've lived all over the world. The, the Miami likes to consider itself an international city. How does it compare? No, I love it because I so much appreciate culture. Uh, you know, I so much appreciate different mindset, different upbringing. You know, and just growing up in Sudan, moving to Egypt, England, coming to the U.S. And having my own culture, I really appreciate and learning uh, about other people's culture. Let's go back to basketball. Uh, you have a distinct style, defense first. Beautiful play inside, blocked at the rim by Day. Walker tries past Napier, Dang with a gorgeous block. And unlike most high-level NBA basketball players, you tend to play your best basketball offensively when you don't have the ball. Luol Dang with a good defensive play and then a follow at the other end. It's the way I learned the game. You know, I just really see the game. I try to be creative. I try to score before I even have the ball. On the wing to Dang. Little step run right to the rim and a two-hand jump. You know, everyone really kind of finds their own game. And coming into the NBA, the biggest thing was, what is my game? You know, and eventually, once I found it, I try to be better at it, and that's just, you know, just keep moving. What are your goals this season? The goal is always to win it all. As a competitor, you always have that belief that no matter what, whoever's with you in the locker room, and you see yourself doing what most people don't believe in, and, you know, that's winning it. Basketball for so many players, including yourself, creates a platform for you to do other things for other people. Uh, you have maxed that out. So tell us a little bit about the Lou Dang Foundation. Well, growing up, uh, I always believed that I'm going to be in a position where I could give back. And once I was drafted, we started the foundation. And I've done so many different things because I could never just pick one thing. It's just whatever I could do to, you know, to help somebody. One that stood out to us was uh, the Lost Boys of Sudan and some of the work that you've done with them. Tell us a little bit about that group. With the civil war in, in, in Sudan, what, uh, what the army would do is they would go into villages and 
it would pretty much take all the kids, uh, all the boys. And a lot of times when the village are raided or when, when there's a war and the army comes into the village, everyone runs away. Those are all the lost boys and they end up in refugee camps. And a lot of them are then held by the governments and taken in. Uh, so there's a lot in the U.S. So what I try to do is, uh, in Chicago, every year we did the Lost Boys' birthday, because a lot of them don't know their birthday. So we celebrated their birthday, and we would just give gifts. And uh, you know, it's something that I, I, I actually love doing it, because most of them speak my language, or they're from my tribe. And uh, it was always fun to talk to them. What drives your sense of responsibility most? I feel like it's my purpose. The, the older I get, the more thing I want to do. And believe me, I want to help everyone here. I know it's kind of deep, but I, I always felt like, uh, you know, helping people is my purpose. For those that started following you uh, once you signed with the Heat, they could see some of the basketball camps that you were working with. Uh, what's your feeling about how you're impacting basketball? I think I've done uh, well. Uh, I think I would do more when I'm done. I really just want to give kids a uh, better chance. You know, I, I think that you don't you don't have to end up playing in the NBA, uh, but basketball opens up a lot of things. Whether it's a scholarship, you know, coming to high school, getting a better education. You won the uh, Walter Kennedy Citizenship Award in 2013-14 for the work that you do. How hard is it to balance everything that's required as an NBA player? and then also maintain the schedule to get all this work done in the community. Um, the times that I get here and there, I try to do as much as I can. I'm really excited, I'm happy to be here. So I spend my summers doing more, and I actually enjoy that, so it's not going out of my way and doing it. I actually enjoy traveling to Africa, so that makes it easier, the fact that I enjoy doing it. Welcome back to Inside the Heat. For Luol Deng, basketball is his business, but soccer was his first love. Yet another game I didn't grow up playing, but I'm willing to learn. And for those of you that follow Deng on social media, you know he has some skills. I've seen these videos on social media. Some drills are fake. Really? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Come on, I'm about to say. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. What, what inspired you to do them? Uh, every time I go work out at the gym, to get loose, I always play soccer. The first one I did, through the cones, and then I kicked the ball through the tire. That was one take. My friend recorded the whole thing. I wanted to start doing it and have more kids get into sports. It just became a trend. So how serious were you about soccer growing up? I was serious. I mean, yeah. it's before basketball came in. Uh, so it was all I knew and all I wanted to do. When I decided to stop playing, my soccer coach was really upset and he thought it was the dumbest decision. Uh, so It worked out, coach. Yeah, it worked out. <laughs> Sorry. Just between you and I, you still play a little bit? I do. <laughs> I do. I do. How careful do you have to be? No, I have to be careful, but you uh, know, in the summer I use it for conditioning okay. uh, more than anything. You think you'd teach me anything? Yeah, I could keep it simple. Yeah, you're gonna need to. Football players never really go down to pick up the ball never. with your hands. It just, I mean, if you're a goalie or you're about to yeah. throw in, but this is a simple, it's just you roll the ball back and you flip it up. Okay, you say it like it's just, no, no, you know, it's it going. is, you're gonna do it. Yeah, right there. Just and that, then, that's all. And then you give it a second kick. Yeah, yeah, a second kick. kick. Right there. Oh, all right, there's a little oh. dexterity. There's a little something there. So you did uh, no, what? no, 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 so no. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> that's pretty good. Now, listen, ten and a half years of this show, this is the best moment we've ever had. Nice. It's a wrap. Good night, everybody. <laughs> all right, Lou, I'm gonna bring in uh, Coco from uh, Soccer Rooftop. Come on over, guys. And Ivan, he's gonna be our uh, goalie, who we've told to go full throttle, by the way. All right. All right. So you got some drills set up for us? What yeah, I got some drills. I'm going to break it down. You come here, around the cone, get to this cone, and that's when and you're going to shoot. That's with the fire. Gotcha. Woo! Woo, he ready. All right, on the whistle. Oh, yeah. See, now we're using the outside of the foot and everything. Now we're going to roll it around. You're my man, oh, Ivan. Come on, Ivan. 
Ooh, nice. <laughs> he didn't fall for all that, all that rigmarole. It's good, man. All right. Oh, wait. You're already coming today. out the shirt? I already. Ready. Look, I'm not the one you got to worry about. Here we go. All right. Under control. All right. Take it around. Nice, nice. Good right. control. And my shoe came untied. Here we go. <laughs> all right. All right. Oh, oh man. That was good. That was sneaking. That was good. Sneaking. We gotta get there one. There we go. Nothing, nothing still. Nil, nil. Come on. Come on. Yeah! Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come on. All right. All right. Yeah. We gotta freeze him. <laughs> you gotta freeze him first. Here we go. All right. Oh, Whoa! <laughs> I tried to get slick on you. <laughs> one nothing. One penalty. Come on. Oh! 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 You had him beat. I had him, I had him duped. Yeah, right in the middle again. Pick a side and just go for it. Oh! Off the post. He so went, close. He went pure power. <laughs> I just, oh, listen, power. I just swung it. Yeah. What up? You yeah. played soccer before? Never. Is Darn. that legal? Like, if there's a ball already in there, I can just kick another one? I'm going to keep my night job. <laughs> you continue to be excellent at two job different things. Too. Exactly. No, no, you can do job, both. But that was perfect, man. Good. It's gracious. This is fun. I think the only way I'm gonna get better at soccer is if they change the rules and let me use my hands. Speaking of change, Lou Aldang has done just that, transitioning from those battles against the Heat in his Bulls uniform to helping the Heat maintain their championship culture as they make a push for the second season. Thank you so very much for watching this edition of Inside the Heat. I am Jason Jackson. Here we go. That paper I dropped now. <laughs> and I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> Believe in it. In the corner. <sighs> Woo. All right. Good. I'm solid now. Ooh. You're not scoring today. <sighs> it's getting worse. All right. Uh. You're going to point off for hitting the cone. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Thanks, bro. That's it. That's good. It's all over. <laughs>